Good evening again and welcome everybody. I'm very happy our tonight's guest is Professor Serhi Plochi and he has the chair, uh, the Mikhailo Khrushchevsky Professorship of, of Ukrainian History. And um, I name this explicitly because uh, most of my students now know who was Mikhail Khrushchevsky, great Ukrainian historian in the 19th century. Uh, Professor Plochi is also the director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University and uh, certainly one of the most distinguished professors of Ukrainian and Soviet and probably also imperial history. So we are really happy uh, to have you here tonight. And just some more remarks to introduce you to our audience and uh, the students. Um, Professor Plochi grew up in Zaporizhia on the Dnieper River in Soviet Ukraine. And he graduated in social sciences at the University of Dnieper Petrovsk and uh, completed then his studies in history in uh, Moscow. And after teaching history at the University of Dnieper Petrovsk from 1983 onwards, uh, he received his PhD in 1990 at the National Taras Shevchenko University in Kiev and uh, became professor of history. Uh, in Ukraine. In 1996, he moved to the US and became professor of history in Alberta before becoming vice director of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, since 2007, he is in Harvard and um, a director of the research center. And he won several prizes for his outstanding books and I won't name them all. It, it's a dozen if I count it correctly. And um, they are all on uh, important topics of Ukrainian uh, imperial or Soviet history and had a great impact on, their, on the um, field as such. And they won several prizes like the Lionel Gerber Prize for the Last Empire the final days of the Soviet Union in 2015, or the Billy Bailey Gifford Prize for nonfiction for Chernobyl, History of a Tragedy in 2018. Um, he is also an expert on the early modern history on the Cossacks mainly. And uh, he published, uh, for example, the Cossacks and religion in early modern Ukraine with Oxford University Press in 2002, um, or on Khrushchevsky, Unmaking Imperial Russia, Mikhail Khrushchevsky and the Writing of Ukrainian History, published with Toronto University Press in 2005. So the last publications are The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine, which was recently translated also into German, uh, Das Tor, Tor Europas, Die Geschichte der Ukraine, uh, published this year, um, or the frontline essays on Ukraine's past and present, also translated into German, Die Frontlinie, Warum die Ukraine zum Schauplatz eines neuen Ost-West-Konflikts wurde. So thank you again for being here with us tonight, uh, Professor Plochi, and uh, the floor is yours. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Schettenberg, for this for this introduction. Thank you for invitation. It's really a great pleasure to talk to students and my colleagues at the University of Bre Bremen and Münster. And I'm I'm certainly very very honored that uh, with this invitation, but also that two of my works have been translated uh, into German this year and are available for the German uh, the German audience. Certainly on the university level, everyone reads English, but that's nevertheless, it's really very, very important for me. Uh, our today's talk uh, and our today's discussion is about the ongoing war, but more uh, a historical perspective on that, the war through the eyes of a historian. And uh, the place where I really want to start this, this uh, discussion is that uh, the war that uh, we now woke up to, uh, woke up to uh, 
uh, on February 24th of this year, really started uh, eight years early, really started with the um, uh, military takeover and annexation of the Crimea, the start of the hybrid war <clears throat> in Eastern Ukraine. So it is at least uh, eight, nine years old. It is a historic development in its own right. Uh, for the first time, really since the end of World War II, we have the uh, case of the annexation of the territory by one state of the territory of another. We really didn't have that since 1945. Uh, the, the last cases of moving borders of that sort were certainly the uh, Polish-German border, and then there was the Soviet Czechoslovak or the Soviet Hungarian border with the Transcarpathia becoming part of the Soviet Union and the Socialist Republic of Ukraine. So annexation of the Crimea of 2014 really opened a new, a new stage in history of Europe and international relations. And for those who still believe that that was actually not a um, uh, game-changing uh, development, uh, the annexations now in September of this year of additional territories uh, in Eastern Ukraine, even the territories that were not and are not under the control of the Russian troops or the Russian army, integration them into the Russian uh, Federation uh, under the Russian constitution uh, is a clear, not just reminder, but a clear, a clear indication that we are in a different place with this war, with the start of the war. The place which is very different from the post-World War II Europe. And that's, that's, that's very important in its own right. If you look at the number of refugees, and uh, certainly the, my colleagues and, and students in Europe know that even much better than my colleagues and students in the United States, we are dealing with the refugee crisis that has been unmatched and matched since the end of the Second World War. So once again, I have to turn the clock back to 1945 to 1944. Which is which is uh, quite uh, quite astonishing in its own in its own right. If you look at the number uh, of people um, in the fighting armies, if you look at the sort of the weaponry that is being used, if you look at the level of destruction, and the level of uh, war crimes and atrocities, again, for better or for worse. We have to go back to World War II as the closest as the closest parallel. So very clearly, we are in a different in a different world with this war, and that became especially clear this this year after after February of 2022. <clears throat> uh, the uh, peace dividend that came with the fall of the Berlin Wall which came with the end of the Cold War really has been used up. We are in a different, in a different place. We are facing uncharted waters of the, of the uh, new world, a new world um, order with the rules of the games and the rules of engagement uh, are not really clear. So as we speak, we are really are in the moment of one of the turning moments in, in, in history. And it's, it, it depends very much on us societies as a whole, what that new world would look like. But beyond that uh, truly historic importance of the developments that we face and the times that we are living through, uh, history uh, has been an important factor in the current war on uh, many, many levels. And uh, one of those levels is of course that like anything in, in our lives, when it comes to the international relations, when it comes to internal politics, uh, history is a major factor. Every, er, every development, every, every uh, new turn has its prehistory and has its roots in history. And this is, this is very important in its own right. 
The second level in which history is part of the current war is the fact that it was really very much legitimized and justified through the use, misuse, and abuse of history. And that is uh, where I would like to uh, turn to my PowerPoint uh, to help me illustrate some of the points that uh, I am going to make. And um, uh, mostly these are, these are images and maps. And uh, I will start with the um, uh, image of uh, the person who, of course, you all recognize. This is the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, whose um, uh, misuse of history, abuse of history, really is a, a, a major, major contributing factor to the to the current war. As you probably know. Um, uh, Putin uh, published in the summer of the last year a major essay on the uh, history of uh, relations between Ukraine and Russia, where already in the very first uh, paragraph of that essay, he basically reinstated uh, the uh, uh, postulate that he, he made already since at least 2013. And that, that argument of his has been that Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people. Um, uh, what, what Putin really meant was not that um, really Russians were Ukrainians. What he meant was that really Ukrainians were Russians or translating that, that postulate in, in, in a more clear language, what that meant was that the Ukrainians didn't exist as a separate nation. And on the basis of that, they really had no right for the, for the independent development or for, for independent state for that matter. Uh, as war progressed and the news about the war crimes and evidence about the war crimes started to uh, come to the fore, there is more and more discussion today, not only about the war crimes, but also about the genocide. G7 recently made a statement in which the, uh, the word genocide was not used, but the word war crimes and the name of Vladimir Putin were coming together in one sentence, uh, in one paragraph, if not one sentence. Uh, in the history of the genocides, one of the key factor and key question that everyone asks is about intention. In the history of this war and the war atrocities and whether you uh, classify them as a genocide or not, the key evidence really comes from the mouth of Vladimir Putin himself and from his essay, which is, which is the strongest, strongest evidence that one can produce about the uh, denial of the right of a particular ethnic group, national group, cultural group, political group to exist. <clears throat> but uh, that, 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 that statement certainly has not only um, legal, uh, legal implications and legal uh, significance. It's also very, very important of how Putin arrives to that conclusion uh, from the point of view of history and, and, and history as such. Uh, the entire essay is really an attempt to provide a historical argument for that overall thesis. And that uh, uh, supply of the historical argument was also something that Vladimir Putin continued in his long speech on the annexation of, uh, or rather at that point, recognition of the so-called independence of the puppet states created by Russia in 2014, the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Uh, that speech was really uh, called by, by many observers as a history lecture. And um, I would also add that de facto that was an actual declaration of war. 
not just uh, the regional war in Eastern Ukraine, but war on Ukraine as a whole, because the, the theme that was in the essay from the summer of 2021 was really then developed and brought to the history of the 20th century, to the history of the Soviet Union in that speech. So those two documents, if you, if you look at the historical justification of the war, uh, those two documents, the essay from the uh, June or July of 2021, and the speech from March of 2022, they really, they really come together. And the argument, the argument there is that uh, Ukrainians really never existed as a uh, separate nation or independent state. That Ukraine, it's it's an artificial uh, formation. Uh, which came into existence through the efforts of the enemies of Russia, uh, from the uh, uh, Poles to the to, to 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 the Austrians, to the mistakes uh, allegedly committed by the leaders of the Soviet state, in particular uh, Vladimir Lenin, but also uh, Joseph Stalin. From that point of view, also doesn't get from Putin high marks for his handling of the Ukrainian question. And what Putin really uh, envisioned with the start of the war in uh, February of this year is an attempt to, to not only rewrite history, but get history right and, and uh, correct the mistakes that were uh, allegedly committed by the uh, previous generations of rulers of either Russian empire, the Soviet Union, or, uh, um, or already post, uh, post-Soviet Russia. <clears throat> now, uh, looking at the at uh, Putin's argument, uh, historical argument per se, one thing that is very obvious to anyone who is familiar with history and historiography of Russia is that it is not original. There are some elements added in terms of the um, analysis or pseudo-analysis of the current situation. But when you look at the historical treatment, it's not, it's not original at all. It comes from the um, main narrative of the Russian historiography of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. The belief that Russians and Ukrainians plus Belarusians are one and the same nation is the foundational myth and mythology of the late imperial Russia from the mid 19th century into the early 20th century. Many uh, uh, arguments and concepts that are put forward by Vladimir Putin in his essay, they come really from the works of the Russian historians mobilized by Count Uvarov after the Polish uprising of 1830. Uh, people like uh, like Ustrelov in particular, who were trying to write a textbook of uh, Russian history, integrating the Western borderlands of the Russian Empire, in particular uh, Ukraine and Belarus, the parts uh, of Ukraine and Belarus that were integrated into the Russian Empire as the parts of the as the result of the partitions of Poland in the late 18th century. And uh, uh, we, we are really presented with the classic imperial, imperial uh, narrative of Russian history, Russian imperial history, not only in terms of the main arguments and tropes, but also with the direct, direct connections and borings to the Russian historiography and concepts of the Russian historiography of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. How does this square or doesn't square with the history of Ukraine and history of Russia, the way how we understand and the way how we interpret it today outside of the, of the classic imperial paradigm that has been presented by, uh, by Putin and certainly then multiplied uh, numerous times uh, by the Russian propaganda and by the Russian media. Um, let me, I'm looking for the ways how to, um, okay, somehow I stuck, 
this Vladimir Putin and can't uh, can't move. Let me try it again. Um, I will stop sharing for a second and then we'll we'll try to bring the images back. All point. Okay, now uh, can you see a different image now? At the moment, we see nothing. We have to. At the moment, you, uh, at the moment you see nothing. Okay, yeah. just just a sec. Just a sec. I will try to share screen. Okay. Uh, do you see now a different image? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, the um, <clears throat> foundational myth of the um, existence of one uh, Russian nation that includes in the language of the 19th century or great Russians um, or today's Russians, uh, white Russians or so Belarusians and little Russians or so Ukrainians really uh, goes back to the history to the history of Kiev and Rus. And uh, that mythology has been really reinforced and replicated in uh, contemporary Russia already after the start of the uh, war in 2014. The next year in 2015, uh, on the incentive of uh, Vladimir Putin, at least that's that's how it looks like, a monument to Prince Volodymyr or Prince Vladimir of Kiev and Rus was built in the very center of Moscow uh, across the, the square from the from Kremlin. And uh, this is this is the strongest uh, um, symbolic indication of the claim that uh, Russia uh, continues to uh, place on the history of the medieval state, medieval empire that was centered in Kiev, because uh, why otherwise the monument to Prince Volodymyr who ruled in the capital of Ukraine, a neighboring state, would be treated with such, with such um, respect and with such um, admiration in the capital of modern and today's Russia. Uh, the Russian claim for Kiev and Rus heritage is actually exclusive. Uh, a claim, because the claim that Kiev and Rus was the, the uh, cradle of the one all Russian nation is actually also a historical, historical foundation for Putin's claim that Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people. What we know today studying, studying Kiev and Rus and Kiev and Rus history is that any sorts of the claims by the modern nations an exclusive heritage of Kiev and Rus are absolutely uh, without, without foundation. Uh, so certainly the, the modern nation didn't, didn't exist at, at, at uh, that time during the Middle Ages. But more importantly, even than that, Kiev and Rus was not just Slavic or East Slavic state. Even the first foundational myth and mythology of the creation of Kiev and Rus state the invitation of the Varangians or the invitation of the um, Vikings to rule over Rus. It pictures not just Slavic tribes, but also Finno Ugric tribes as being the, the key uh, stakeholders in the state that is known today as Kiev and Rus and the, the, the active participants in this alleged invitation of the Varangians, of course, Kiev and Rus is a, one of the many, many um, so-called state building, but not nation building projects associated with the Varangian uh, wars and Varangian conquests in Europe, in Europe at that time. <clears throat> Ukraine uh, for the first time uh, emerges on the map of Europe as uh, with the name Ukraine. Uh, at the beginning of the 16th century, which sees uh, Ukraine functioning in a very, very different environment from the one in which 
Russia um, and uh, um, parts of Russia around Moscow, but also parts of Russia around Novgorod functioned uh, um, after the Mongol invasion of the mid 13th century. Ukraine emerges as a Cossack state out of the uh, um, structure that is known as a Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a structure that um, brought into the Ukrainian history, political history, a number of uh, extremely important uh, elements, uh, culturally, politically, economically, associated not with the former Mongol empire, or not even with the existence of the Ukrainian lands as part of Kievan Rus, but associated with the European and Central European development. Uh, you see that uh, by the time the Cossacks led by Bogdan Khmelnytsky create the first uh, Cossack state centered around Dnieper and, and Kyiv being one of the key centers of that state, uh, what is important for the Cossack elites at that time are the ideas of the rights and privileges, not of their state, but also of their estates, of, of their social groups. What is important for them uh, is the existence of the uh, institutions of higher learning, like the Kiev Mohila Academy. Uh, that, as a college, it was established in the year 1632, four years between a college uh, named Harvard was established was established in the in the United States, and one of the demands of the Cossack elites when they negotiate and renegotiate with the Polish kings is the right of that college to uh, have name academy. So by the time uh, the um, Russian uh, troops appear on the territory of uh, Ukraine. Um, this is the year 1654, and negotiations on the integration of the Cossack Ukraine into the Russian state start. The two uh, political groups, the, the two nations really need interpreters to understand each other. And this is certainly true when it comes to the correspondence between Hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky and uh, Tsar Nicholas uh, and, and, and Tsar uh, Mikhail Alexeyevich. At that time, we see in the archives uh, numerous cases of the of the translation done specifically in the uh, in the Tsar's chancellery for the uh, for the uh, diplomats and 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 uh, elite the, the state elite of the Moscovite state or Russian state at that time. Despite all of that, 1654, the so-called Periyaslav Council of 1654, has an extremely important role in the history of the mythology about the uh, Russian-Ukrainian friendship. And it did, indeed, uh, mythology about Russians and Ukrainians being one and the same people. The so-called concept of reunification of Russia and Ukraine it starts in the uh, empire of the 19th century, and it then it then continues into the uh, into the Soviet period with uh, a lavish anniversary celebration of the 300 year anniversary of the so called reunification of Russia and Ukraine, um, celebrated by Nikita Khrushchev in the year 1954. Um, Ukraine uh, emerges and, and the modern Ukrainian national project starts like uh, it starts in the case of uh, a number of other non-state nations of Eastern and Central Europe after the Napoleonic Wars in the first half of the, of the 19th century with the uh, formation of the first political project uh, by the members of the St. Cyril and Methodius Brotherhood in um, Kiev, around Kiev University, was headed by the professor of that university, Nikola Kostomarov. Among the members is uh, Ukraine's best known uh, and consequential poet of the 19th century, Taras Shevchenko. What you see, the way how uh, 
empire and Russian empire response to that challenge coming from the formation of the modern Ukrainian national project, which is based on the language, based on culture, based on a separate history associated with the Cossack hetmanate. The way how empire responds to that, it tried to adjust the idea, the model of one big Russian nation by suggesting that there were three different tribes within that nation, little Russians, uh, and then great Russians symbolized by that uh, tall woman uh, with the cross at the center of the image and then white Russians or Belarusians. And the idea was that despite the fact that there are indeed linguistic differences between this uh, three different tribes, all of them constitute big Russian nation. So this is an attempt to maintain the unity of the uh, what the empire tries to create as a one dominant Russian nation while recognizing recognizing the cultural and other differences between those groups. And this is this is really what I called before that the foundational myth of the late imperial Russia, uh, the Russia of the second half of the uh, Russian empire, of the second half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the sort of the mythology that serves as a foundation uh, for, the, for the ideas, for the arguments, and also an inspiration for Putin, who has been trying to turn the clock back into the, in terms of the development of the separate Slavic nations, turn the clock back to the 19th and 20th century. The Russian Empire tried to arrest the development of separate Ukrainian national project, banning for more than 40 years the publication in Ukrainian language of uh, uh, works, uh, literary works and, 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 and academic works, but mostly primers or translation of Bible into Ukrainian. That, that was the, one of the most important purposes of that, of that um, uh, a, a, number, a, a number of laws that were passed in the second half of the 19th century. They succeeded in not arresting the Ukrainian project as such, but certainly in slowing down it. And by the time that the uh, revolution uh, came to the uh, Russian empire in 1917, Ukrainian project turned out to be strong enough to create a number of states and claim independence, but not strong enough to defend that independence. And what we see is another attempt on the part now of the Soviet Union and uh, the uh, communist, communist leaders of what used to be the Russian Empire to find a different, different accommodation for the, for the uh, Russian uh, nationalism on the one hand, but uh, mostly for the, for the Ukrainian and other minority nationalists. So the Soviet Union is being created in 1922-1923 with recognition granted to the Ukrainians and Belarusians, not only as being separate tribes, but also formal recognition of them being separate nations. That was a very, very important development in its own right. Very important, not just for Ukrainians and for Belarusians. And what you see here uh, is of course the photo from Belaveja, December 1991, uh, the leaders of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, those alleged parts of the one big Russian nation are gathered together and sign a document dissolving the Soviet Union. So the importance of, of that Soviet arrangement was there not only for Ukrainians and Belarusians in terms of their recognition, or the allowance, for example, and on for a short period of time, promotion of Ukrainian and Belarusian language in the school system of Ukraine and Belarus. But not less important was the fact that for the first time, the Russian Federation acquired borders and institutions that were separate from the borders and institutions of empire, whatever is the name of that empire, is either the Tsardom uh, of Moscow, the Russian Empire, or the Soviet Union. Uh, 
Um, it is in that capacity as a representative of a body of the territory of the institutions separate from the union that Boris Yeltsin is present uh, or was present in December of 1991 at the meeting in Bella Veja signing signing that that all important uh, that all important agreement and uh, it is exactly the the Soviet model of the solution of the um, issue uh, and, and tensions between rising Ukrainian and, and uh, Russian and to a degree Belarusian um, national projects that Vladimir Putin is, is extremely unhappy about and extremely critical about. So when you look at what is happening today with the current, with the current war, and the policies that are being introduced on the territories either temporarily occupied or formally annexed by the Russian Federation, you see that there is a complete, complete turn away from the Soviet policies of the recognition either of separate nations, uh, Ukrainians in particular as a separate nation, or recognition of any right for Ukrainian language or culture to develop. Uh, the latest news coming from the um, uh, territory of Donbass, the uh, uh, territory of Donbass that is under the Russian control today, the so-called um, um, Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, is that their thinking about their constitution and the future actually doesn't foresee any provisions for Ukrainian language whatsoever. Uh, the statements coming from there are that, that that language is not, we are not, there is no need for it. We don't need it. The same is true for what you see with the uh, so-called educational reforms that uh, the Russian occupational authorities were trying to introduce on the territory of, um, and still try to do that on not liberated yet parts of the Kherson Oblast where the, the Ukrainian language, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian curriculum is being completely, completely thrown out. The model is the destruction of the Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture, and uh, turning really uh, uh, the, the um, Ukrainians into, into parts of a, big, of a big Russian nation. That is, that is the, the, the really goal that has been declared by uh, Vladimir Putin at the start of the war. And despite the fact that the model turned out to be completely false, the Ukrainians showed very well that they were not Russians. They didn't welcome the Russian troops with flowers, how uh, they expected that to happen in Kremlin. The Russian language citizens of uh, um, cities like Berdyansk or, or Kherson or Militopol were marching with Ukrainian flags against the armed Ukrainian uh, uh, Russian forces in uh, late February and March of this year. And what you see today as the result and outcome of this war, at least one of them, even before the war is over, but one of its outcome is already clear, that the concept and the idea of the uh, one big Russian nation, Russian-Ukrainian unity, and existence of one nation and not two has been defeated on the battlegrounds of, of Ukraine today. It is very much the end, or at least the way how I see it, the end of the, of the um, way of interpreting or misinterpreting history, the way of thinking about nations and nationalities that has its origins in the mid 19th century and that it comes it comes to an end today. Um, we, as I said, we don't know yet when the war will end, in what way, where will be the borders. But one thing for me is very clear. It's not just defeat of the idea of the pan-Russian concept of pan-Russian nation, but it is certainly uh, an emergence of a much stronger and much more united and unified Ukrainian nation. United not by language, 
but united by the idea of a common reading and common understanding of history, which was a problem for Ukrainians for a long period of time, but that's that, that common understanding is emerging today. And by the idea of the political nation in which the, the main loyalty is to the institutions, in particular democratic institutions, not to, to, to the idea of uh, narrowly understood idea of language or culture. I know that I, out of, of my time, I want uh, to thank you for, uh, for your uh, attention and for your uh, uh, patience. And uh, I know that uh, the next uh, stage, uh, stage of our discussion doesn't involve me, but uh, at some point, at some point, uh, I, I will, you will bring me back to, to discuss the questions that students might have.